Welcome to Rico 12. I'm Justin, your host and a beautifully imperfect, stumbling, bumbling child of an absolutely powerful and perfectly loving God and an addict. Rico 12 is all about exploring the common threads of addiction and sharing tools and hope from those on a similar path. We gather from diverse backgrounds, faiths, and places to learn and support one another. Our speakers represent various fellowships, addictions, and afflictions, thus showing the common threads of recovery no matter our addiction or affliction. Today's speaker for the 257th meeting is Tony H., another first-time RICO 12 speaker. His chosen topic today is identification, and I look forward to hearing his message here in just a few minutes, but first for just a little bit of business. RICO 12 has several recovery resources in our family of podcasts and social media communities, To learn more, listen more, connect more, or just hang out and learn and grow with us, you can check out the other podcasts that you find at www.rico12.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2.com. And you can also join our social communities and check out the chat in the show notes. So I've got links to the social communities here in the chat, and I'll be posting those a couple more times throughout the meeting, as well as in the show notes of the podcast. RICO 12 is self-supporting, and your contributions help us continue our mission Thanks to our spearheads for new and repeat contributors. This week, I wish to acknowledge and thank both Cheryl and Tony for becoming monthly donor spearheads, one through Buzzsprout, which is our podcast platform, and the other through Patreon. Your donations really help in this project. If you also feel the desire to become a spearhead and support this cause, visit rico12.com forward slash support, or click on the links that will be in the the chat here and in the show notes of the podcast for one-time or monthly donation options. Your support, not just financially, but with your word of mouth, makes a difference in keeping us able to share these messages of recovery. We look forward each week to receiving from the light reflected from our speakers. That light inspires hope, meaning, worth, and growth in us, the listening audience. Now I'm going to introduce our guest speaker for today, Tony H., and give just a little background on him. Tony's recovery bio is a story of relapses and brief moments of continuous sobriety. It wasn't until he completely gave himself to this simple program that he found peace and felt clean inside. Take it away, Tony. The floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Justin. And thank you, everybody, for allowing me to share in this platform. Um, And happy uh, four years, Justin, for this amazing podcast that you've had going Um, Grateful to be here. Uh, my name is Tony, and I am an alcoholic. Um, let's see here. We. I want to gra- uh, give my gratitude to first this this uh, platform and to Justin and to Alcoholics Anonymous as a whole. There's a few people here that I invited in. Thank you for um, showing up, and to the newcomers or the people that are coming back. You know, there is a solution. And if you do hear any of it today, that's awesome. If not, just keep coming back, keep coming back. And then, uh, um, yeah, we'll start it off. You know, I got into these rooms um, at an early age. I was uh, 19 years old. And um, and before that, I'll, I'll go back. I might be jumping around here a few times. But um, before even I took my first drink, I, I, I felt the... Uh, the un um the unwanted or I, I couldn't identify with anybody um i felt like an oddball um from day one um my very first memory was at five years old and it was a memory of fear and abandonment um i was put into an orphanage um in bogota colombia and at that time I had no idea what was going on. I, uh, the, the fear set in because I was taken away from my family. That's all I could remember. And being in an orphanage, um, I, I, I had nobody that I could, you know, look up to or anything like that. And right away that fear, and I'm going to say fear a lot in my, um, in my share because most of that was in my addiction and, what had happened is I finally got adopted. My sister, um, who was not blood sister, but she was in the same orphanage as I was. And we we were both adopted into an American family in mid well, central Minnesota, West Central Minnesota. And well, that created a culture shock 
is, you know, if you can, you know, picture that. And um, right away, I felt out of place. Um, couldn't speak the language. You know, I went to a Catholic school um, and we didn't have any interpreters or anything like that. So eventually I did lose my language, um, created another um you know, barrier for me not understanding who I, where I came from or who I was. Um, so that identity was taken, um, I think was just uh, taken away. Um, so at, at, you know, age five, I grew up in a small town, not many Hispanics, not many people that spoke Spanish and um, struggled. I struggled in school. I mean, um, a lot of it had to do with the learning, maybe learning disabilities, but I'm not really too sure exactly what. But, um, you know, I had an older brother and he was their biological son. Um, another memory that stands out. Um, and this is the relationship that my mother and I had. And it kind of all started with this the situation that happened was uh, it must have been doing something that she didn't like. And she got on the phone pretending that she was calling the orphanage and <laughs> saying that she was going to send me back. The fear of that and that memory uh, stuck out. And I knew after that, that my relationship with her was going to be different. And my father, he, uh, he was a loving Norwegian, um, just always there for me understood, you know, the things that I've, uh, been going through, um, you know, like I, I, there was no record on what happened in, in Columbia. I have no record of what happened, why I was put in an orphanage. Um, that, that has still, you know, is in my mind and, and, and I try to give it away, you know, I try to give it to God and it's still, I take it back. And I've, I've been struggling with that, um, in when I was drinking too. But then we fast forward a little bit um, into my grade school years and high school years. Um, it, it, like I said, I felt like I wasn't a part of anything and, or anyone. Um, and then I, you know, I remember the first time I started drinking and the feeling that I got and the, the feeling that they talk about in the big book. I felt alive. You know, like I have arrived, you know what they say. And it was amazing. Um, I, I felt that I was better looking. I was taller. Uh, you know, I, the words that were coming out of my mouth made sense. And and people, you know, um, you know, like I was important, you know, and I was unique. That's, that's so I thought. And and then, uh, you know, I kept. I kept with my studies, you know, I barely graduated. I was into sports. Uh, sports are huge. Um, but there was no, uh, there, there was no, uh, what do you call it? There's just not, nothing that uh, kept me away from drinking. Um, there's no, and I continued doing that after high school. And then, and this is a progression disease. And I kept on um, searching for, you know, what, what is it that God wants me in, the, in in this life like what does he want me to do and like i said at age 19 i was put into uh, the state hospital in minnesota in the chemical dependency unit i went there and at that time they had a bus that take that took everybody to the the uh, alano club in in that town and there i saw people in this aa meeting and they were all laughing they had smiles on their face. They looked good. They looked exactly the way I wanted to, to feel. And, you know, I, I I got into a halfway house after that. And uh, one of my counselors, you know, he, he told me, you know, you need to, this is what the three things you need to do. You need to get a sponsor, read the big book and go to meetings. And I didn't know anything what that meant what that looked like. And I was 19 years old. And so I eventually did go back out because I, you know, they talk about, you know, this is a lifestyle for a lifetime. And I could not even think about ever not drinking again. That was just way too overwhelming for me. And so I decided to go back out. You know, I didn't have any consequences really until I, you know, got my first DUI. And then I had another, you know, 
stint of treatment. <clears throat> so fast forward a little bit here, and then I continue on that path of in and out, um, thinking that, you know, this time is going to be different. You know, I'm not going to tr drink and drive. I'm not going to, you know, drink on during the week. Um, but I still, it, it still didn't work. Um, and, and having that mind of recovery, but yet still drunk and knowing that there is another way out is, is a hard way. It's a hard way to live really. Um, and that's what I continue doing throughout my years. Um, finally, I decided to go back to college, um, and try to make something of myself, you know, and that addiction, that alcoholism didn't progress totally at that time, you know, I was able to get to class and in my first two years, you know, I got into education and the first two years were good. The first two years were great. And then, um, you know, I, <laughs> I met a woman and, she, you know, she had the same strides and, and dreams and, and things in her life. And, and we connected and she, she didn't drink as much as I did, but she did, didn't say anything about my drinking. So it was all good. Right. And, uh, we got married and, um, had a couple kids and, you know, I've always wanted to have my own family and that really was important to me because growing up, I didn't feel like I was a part of the family that I grew up in. Um, and I was always trying to reach that, the better way of life and, when I got into this marriage, you know, and, and when I, we had our first child, I thought that that's it, you know, things are going to change. You know, my life is going to be different. I'm not going to have to worry about drinking ever again. And I thought that my child was going to keep me sober. And that lasted for a little while. And I went back out and I ended up getting, um, you know, more consequences in my life and DUIs. And so then that marriage uh, lasted for about five years. And then eventually we had a divorce. Um, and then I met somebody else that was drinking like I drank. And I, yeah, we were, we were just a match made in hell, really. We, we just uh, continued doing our thing. And um, she had some health issues on the side and we had a, a daughter together, um, which is what well, she's 13 now. And this is the kind of thing that, you know, is going on. It's, it's in and out, in and out of this, in this program. And, you know, I'm getting six months here, I'm getting nine months here. Um, and, and really not doing, you know, they talk about the half measures and, and how it works and how they do not work, you know, <laughs> availed us nothing exactly. And that's, um, and I didn't get it, you know, and I still had to have these tests in my life and there, and I would, and that five-year-old would come back into my, into my, my, my head of fear and, and not a uh, fear of the unknown. Like, is this it? Is this all that life is going to offer me is coming in and out of these rooms and the obsession of the mind comes in where I know I can't drink. I know I shouldn't drink. And this is what happens when I do. You know, eventually consequences do come in my life. But the fact that they don't right away, that my mind tells me, see, it's okay. You know, you're not drinking every day, at least. But that comes, you know, that comes in time. And then it comes to where I get back into these rooms, you know, either in, in um, handcuffs or in rubber slippers. And if you understand, if you can relate, then you can relate. Um, because that's the only way got me that it would get me back into these rooms. And then I had a year for the first time. And I thought that was amazing. And I thought I was on top of the world. And I kept on coming back. And I still were, you know, I was still doing the half measures, though but I was still sober. And so in 2017, I had about, I think it was two and a half years, two and a half years sober. And uh, the daughter that I was talking about that I had with the alcoholic, her mother passed away from this disease. 
and it was eventually going to happen. She was on a liver transplant and um, she just didn't, didn't make it. And so I, me, I, I, I wasn't really ready for taking charge of a six year old. Um, but I knew, you know, I had some sobriety in me and that I was ready and I did that. Um, and then things started falling apart. I couldn't get any assistance from the state of Minnesota and I felt just cheated and then I was angry and nobody was helping me, but I wasn't asking for help. <laughs> and so what happened is eventually I went back out. I ended up getting another DUI and she and her grandparents took her from me and, you know, I had to sign the rights over to her. And so I, you know, then back into, you know, day one, you know, starting back in day one and that uh, it, it took me a while to get back into the rooms. And it, uh, once again, um, I thought maybe I could go back out. Maybe this time I won't hit it as hard, but I would continue having, you know, a job here and there. That's, you know, functional, right? As in, in my eyes, I was a functioning alcoholic and everybody else, I was a madman. You know, I was crazy um, and nobody wanted to be near me. Nobody wanted to be near me. And, you know, and once I told them about my past, it's just like, oh, yeah, that makes sense. Um, but I continue um, doing that back and forth, you know, one leg in, one leg out. And uh, and then uh, let's see what I got uh, 2000 during the COVID where, yeah, I just had enough, enough was enough, and um, popped into the Zoom meetings because they didn't have in-person, and I met some wonderful people who I'm still friends with in the, in this program, and thank God for Zoom, because at that time, I needed a meeting almost every day. You know, if, it was, if I wasn't at work, I was on a meeting. Um, and I got a sponsor through um, through Zoom at that time. And he's going to be a service next year at one of our conventions that we have here in Fargo, North Dakota. And I'm so excited for that. Anyways, um, so I went back in and I had a very, um, it was a year, I think it was, about a year of sobriety. And then um, I ended up getting laid off of work. At that time, I did not know what to do with myself because I did my my meetings did get cut off a little bit and I uh, wasn't doing service work and I wasn't working with my sponsor. I wasn't doing all these things. As you can see, this this is kind of the kind of trend that I have, you know, the the you know the half measures kind of stuff that you know I, I do very little. You know, I show up and that's about it. And um so eventually I went back out and I stayed out for a while. And there's times where, you know, my intentions wasn't to go back out and create havoc and, and get myself into trouble. You know, my intentions just get this, this feeling of, of not being wanted, not being, you know, things not going my way. You know what I mean? All these character defects I have, I want to somehow, um, just silence them in my mind. And the only solution that I had, that I had left, was to keep drinking. And I continued that, you know, daily. Now I'm a daily drinker. Now I'm a morning drinker. Now I'm getting to work and half in the bag. And eventually, I do get another DUI. And I get an uh, ankle monitor. And I'm and I, and, I, and I'm there again. That's five year old. That is fear of the unknown and is fearful comes back into my life. You know when is this going to stop, God? When am I going to feel clean inside? When am I going to feel all this stuff that everybody I see everybody else do in these rooms? I don't understand, but I have to stop, and I did stop in uh, 2023. March 12th was my last train. Or March 11th, actually. But um, so 
you know, I like my my uh, my recovery has relapse in it, but it also has sobriety in it as well in recovery. And I want to make sure that, you know, people are not um, <laughs> see, well, AA doesn't work, obviously. It's just that I didn't work AA, you know, where AA was always there and it's always going to be there for me. And I know I don't know how much more time I have left, Justin, but um, I really do want to talk about, about 10 the minutes. OK, perfect. And then, you know, at, at that time, um, I did finally he got into a meeting on Zoom. And I needed to find a sponsor that was going to kick my ass and needed to find somebody that was in the book, in the solution and could speak this a language and i found and i found her on one of my home groups because she had what i wanted and i i you know i texted her and said one i need a sponsor can you sponsor me and the first day i was ready <laughs> i was ready to hang up on her cuz she was telling me everything i did not want to hear but I did need to hear, and I couldn't in my mind. And God was there with me, telling me, "No, this is the person that you need in your life. Do not hang up. We're not going to do this again." And so I continued on, and we're still, you know, doing work. We're still communicating. We got through the uh, twelve steps with the help of another sponsor. Which, yes, I'm that sick. I need two. I may need three. I don't know, but. Whatever I, it takes, I need to do this, and I can't do it halfway anymore. You guys heard what happens, and this is just my experience. You know, other people have done other ways of being sober, but this is the only way that has gotten me sober, and that's working with another alcoholic. I now just got another sponsee last night at a group, uh, one of my... Um, one of my meetings that in person I, that I do, and I'm looking forward to that. I I, uh, I sponsor a gentleman um, that lives in Germany, you know? I mean, what an amazing program we have that we can connect all over the world. And that's what I do. And that's one of the bigger things too, is service. That's one thing that I didn't really do before and and now I've uh, I've gone all the way in. I've been able to go into jails. I've been able to go into treatment centers. I've been able to talk about the solution and what it was um, you know what it was like when I was out there. And it was deadly. Um, I also. Um, you know, did some commitments that I didn't think I was ready for, but God told me I needed to do. And I'm looking forward to that, you know, more will re be revealed. And so I continue doing this. Um, my story is, you, you know, I might have left some things out, but I tell you, if you can identify in any way, shape or form in any of the stuff that I talked about, you know, about the craving that sets in after your first drink. You know, and then the obsession of the mind. You know, that obsession got taken away. I don't obsess over alcohol anymore. I have other things that I obsess over, but they're not going to land me in jail. And I can work with that with another sponsor. I can, you know, share that in my meetings. And those are the things that keep me sober. It's because I, I, I am, I feel that I am a part of something, something great. And once again, I got my this identity that that I thought I lost. I have gained back, and I love being able to you know connect with others um, everywhere around the world because their recovery is different. But it's not if that makes any sense. And the stories, yeah, just the identification really is what keeps me coming back. So if you're new or if you're coming back like I have been many times, there is hope in these rooms. There's a lot of love in these rooms too. 
And I want you just to, you know, take it all in, reach out. You don't have to think about drinking forever, you know, just, just for today. And my sponsor used to say, one of my sponsors used to say, how free do you want to be? Now, how free do I want to be? Because I can do the minimal. And that's exactly what I'm going to get out of it. So today I try to do more than I usually do. And, then, and it, that's been working for me. So keep coming back or stay, stay in these rooms. It's easier to stay in these rooms than it is to get back, let me tell you. But if you are back and you do stay, um, I'm glad to be part of your life and part of um, your recovery because you've helped me so many times and just showing up. And I appreciate you, Justin, and thank you so much. Awesome. Thank you, Tony. Really appreciate your share, your story, a little bit of your background there. I've written down several questions here and a reminder to our live audience. If you have a question that you'd like to pose for Tony, please type it in the chat. If you'd like to remain anonymous or either direct a message me or type anonymous before you, uh, you uh, hit send on that. And we'll get to those questions as we get along here. Tony, I really identify with well, well, with several things here that you shared, but I want to go towards the end of your share. You talked about getting a sponsor here uh, fairly recently who you wanted to hang up on on your first call because she was telling you what you did not want to hear and was really laying it down. The first sponsor I got, I feel the same way. I, I hated him. He was all over my step four inventory. I put his name in there several times and, you know, I'll show you by reading this to you that that you're on my on my crap list, but that's what I needed. I personally was somebody who needed somebody who was going to kick my butt at first and not take me through with, with soft gloves. My current sponsor is a much more soft glove type person, and that's what I need now. But to get in the rooms, I needed somebody that was going to just tear me up and, and, and make me realize that there's no half measures in this. Talk to us a little bit about the benefits of that and maybe some of the, uh, the, the, uh, well, things you gained from that type of uh, sponsorship? Yes, uh, that's a great question because, you know, I it, something had to change. And it, what I was doing wasn't working. And I had to, you know, take um, suggestions or, you know, what what they told me. And I, I you know, like I said, I couldn't I couldn't do it my way anymore. And the thing is, it's like I had to hear the truth and I had to hear the facts about this disease and um, regardless of what, you know, how I felt inside, I knew, and she told me that, you know, things will get better. And yeah, she did lay off, you know, <laughs> after a while, it, finally, but, you know, but I didn't need, I needed that. And I probably still need that every now and then. And she, she'll remind me of it. Um, and yeah, that's, that's one of the things it's just, I just need to shut up and listen you know, listen and, and, and take notes and really, um, do what I'm told more or less. Cause I am, I'm still a child, you know, I'm still a baby in this program. So. Thank you for sharing that, Tony. Um, your story from the, from the beginning that you started sharing is pretty painful and powerful from the orphan being dropped off at an orphanage to being taken out of your home country uh, having to learn a new language from from scratch um, as a small child and just feeling uh, outside all the time. How has that, um, I mean, you did wrap this up by saying, hey, I found my people. I found my people in these rooms. But uh, how have you been able to maybe make peace with those early days? Or are you still working at making peace with those early days? Yeah, I, you know, <laughs> At first, I use that, you know, towards my drinking. Like, uh, I, there's, hey, there's another one, thing to uh, drink about because I have no, um, no history, no documentation about my family in Colombia. Nothing. There's just hidden lies. I don't know, but it, it was hard for me. It was hard for me to overcome that resentment, and I don't even know who to resent. You know, like who do I resent? Um, so there's, 
you know, and then also just losing, you know, my language. It's it's like it would have been very beneficial, obviously, to be able to be bilingual. But, you know, I had to accept that because, you know, like I said, I don't need to use that, you know, in, in you know, I'm not I'm not unique in that aspect. You know, I'm just like anybody else. And there's people here that have far worse childhood, you know, than I had. And, and I'm and I'm fine with that, you know, and I have to accept that. So that's where I've gone with that. Thank you. Thank you. You you mentioned several times that uh, you would, as a, as a youth, you would ask God, "Hey God, what what do you want from me? What is what is this plan ahead?" And and you saying, "Hey, I feel God guiding me to do this, that, and the other." How has your perception of God? Where did it start um, from your first experiences or memories of God, and how has that changed in recovery? I honestly, I, you know, like I said before, I grew up in a Catholic home and went to Catholic school. And I thought that I had a connection with God, you know, and that I, and it just didn't seem like I did. It wasn't until I got into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous where I actually had that spirituality that people talk about, you know, that connection with a higher power, which is God for me. Um, and there's, they call it what, God shots, you know? I mean, a guy sitting next to me last night and needed a sponsor. I mean, you know what I mean? Just God shots like that, that happened that I know that God's there. He is sending me people um, for me to be a service of. And so, yeah, at a young age, I was confused. I didn't know what to expect, you know? And there's been times where I was close to death. I mean, I got hit by a car. Um, send in the hospital. A couple times I, you know, passed out on the highway. I mean, there's certain things that I know God is, has sent down his angels, um, either uh, heavenly angels or earth angels. And I might have some in this room right now, but yeah, it, it's, just, uh, um, it, it's a, pro, it's a progress, I guess, a uh, process or progress. I don't know which word to say in that, but it's uh, definitely getting um, stronger, my connection with him. And how, how are you working on strengthening, um, um, improving that conscious contact with God? What what does that practice look like in your life today? Well, I sure have to pray more um, and meditate because they say prayer is a way of me talking to God and meditation is a way of me listening to God. So those things I need to do a lot more. Um, but working with others has really made, you know, and I think that's what God has put me on this earth is to help others. And, and, it would, and it's not even just in the, the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, it's just helping my, my, you know, neighbor, my, my um, coworker, um, you know, person in the grocery store, you know, those are the chances that God's given me that to, to be a service, to be maximum service of him and to my fellows. Thank you, um, Tony. Uh, next, next question I have for you. It's a statement followed by a question. You know, your your list of things that you've lost due to alcoholism is is pretty big. I mean, you've you've gone back through the rooms. You've lost uh, relationships. You you even lost a a a loved one to the disease of alcoholism. Um, and uh, as you as you consider those things, it's apparent that the consequences aren't enough motivation to keep you sober. So what is your motivation now to stay, to stay sober? My motivation really lies in, in others. Um, when they talk about the first days, when they talk about losing um, custody with their kids, you know, this gentleman that I'm going to sponsor, he, he hasn't, no idea where his kids are right now. And he, you know, he's not on the birth certificate. He doesn't have any rights, but he doesn't know where they're at. You know, that motivates me because what it used to be like, that's what it used to be like. And I don't want to go back there. So working with others has really helped me. That, thank you for sharing that. And I'm assuming, you know, working with others means, you know, sponsoring others, being of service in meetings. What are some other ways that you find are helpful for you to work with others and share, practice these principles in all your affairs? Um, I think just, uh, 
you know, because service work really gets me out of my head and it, it keeps me away from my thinking, which really, if we look at it, you know, that is the, the, the main um, problem, I guess, in my experience is my thinking. Um, and so when I do that, then I'm able to um, think of others and think, you know, and help others do that. And, um, you know, just keep continuing sharing my story um, any way, shape or form. Um, that is, I think that is one of the things that has, uh, has grown in my, in my recovery. All right. Um, another thing you mentioned in your share, Tony, was doing some prison minutes, some prison outreach, some pr- going into prisons and sharing your story in there. Talk to us a little bit about, you know, fear. You, you mentioned that fear is a big part of this, the fear that you felt in that, the courage that it took to, 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 go through and do this and what, what, uh, what the benefits of doing prison work are in your life. Well, that's another, you know, thing I, that I just talked about is that, you know, it's a reminder of where I could be at, you know, if I continue this path and there's times, you know, when I wake up in jail and not knowing how I got there. Um, and I'd have to ask the, the, <laughs> the uh, jailer you know what the the charges are and you know and he would most of the time it would just be disorderly and and i'm like okay that's not so bad but you know having that that time in there and then coming back out and seeing these fellows that 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 i used to be you know i used to be in those clothes and i think that is just a good reminder of what would happen if i would come back out and start using again. Yeah, thank you. I've got a question that came in from our our live audience, not an anonymous person. Um, This person says, I also have small amounts of sobriety, and then I relapse. How do I let go of all of those bottle lines? And this is a phrase that I'm not familiar with. Are you familiar with the phrase bottle lines? I don't think I've ever heard of that. <laughs> okay. How do I fully let go of all of these things and all what I'm assuming from, from this question? So let me re-ask it. I also have a small amount of sobriety and then I relapse. How do I fully let go of all of the things that keep coming up? I quit one and then I start doing another. I feel so hopeless. What are your, what's your take on that, Tony? Oh, I can definitely identify with that because there is a lot of hopelessness that is involved when you keep on uh, in and out, you know, and I would suggest to reach out, um, and, and get some contacts. Um, and then eventually, you know, get a sponsor, um, keep going to meetings. Um, these things, yeah, they will, they will continue in your head, but when you take the next right action and you're being part of the, the action, part of this recovery, it goes, it starts, it starts going away. And it's, and I don't know, in my, in my like experience, um, it, they're not as, um, they're not as loud, you know what I mean? They're not as loud and I'm able to, you know, Hey, I'm going to take this to my, my, um, my counselor or do I take to this to my, um, my sponsor, you know, I, I work it, I find the, the, the proper appointed authority they say in the book. So that's one thing. Maybe there might be a counselor that you need to talk to, a therapist. But you have to take action. Yeah. Um, kind of along those lines, um, you talked a lot about half measures. Talked about a, uh, some about being all in, not having one leg in, in and one leg out. Um, one of the scariest things for me, one of the things I was most resistant to when I first came in these rooms was reaching out to others. You know, I always thought I don't want to bother them by have, making a phone call and, and uh, uh, being an imposition on them and their time. But I know that whenever people call me, I never feel that way, but I still don't want to impose on anybody else. How do you how do, how do you work with that in your own life of, of uh, reaching out and being all in in that con- in in being of service to others or in being vulnerable with others. Yeah, definitely can identify with that because I I've done that uh, recently and almost daily where I know I need to reach out and um, I'll 
whatever it takes, you know, I, I will text somebody. I say, hey, are you available? I need to talk, you know. And, you know, I have this amazing sister that is, uh, she lost a loved one. Um, her boyfriend committed suicide in January. And now she's starting to get into the, the program of Al-Anon. And I reach out to her, you know what I mean? She's had so much growth already and she's uh, a newcomer. And so I reach out to her because she's starting, you know, to understand, um, hey, you know, I'm not feeling right. Now, do I stay stuck in this or do I do something? Like I said, there's got to be action involved. It's got to be action. Yeah. So, so when you personally start feeling stuck in this or maybe start feeling some victim thinking or some resentment, walk us through kind of your process. Maybe it's, you call it the step, the 10th step process, or walk us through your process of moving through those uh, negative emotions and situations. But right away, I got to pray. I got to ask God to direct me into the right direction. And then I need to connect with somebody, you know, at first it's going to be my sponsors. um, And then it will be, you know, another fellow in these, in these rooms, but I can get stuck in that place. And the longer I get stuck in that, the more and more I start listening to my own great ideas and that's a dangerous, dangerous spot for me. So I, um, I have to get out of my head. You know, if I have to take a walk, I'll do that. I'll go outside, take a walk, and get into God's, you know, world. And and those are the things that you know have helped me. Because I don't know with you, Justin, but yeah, you, you can tell. I mean, you you've been in these rooms long enough. You can tell when you're starting to get that, you know, feeling. Um, that squirrely feeling they call it, um, and that's where that's when it's time for me to 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 reach out. Yeah. So the 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 thought I have here on this, Tony, is uh, you know when, and I love how you said that squirrely feeling. You know, when I, if I am in touch enough with my recovery with my connection with my higher power, I can identify those. For me, usually it takes a little bit before I go, Oh, I am going down this path in the wrong direction. I'm starting to believe my own ideas and my own thoughts and plans that I have here. Um, How do you differentiate between your own good ideas that you think are good ideas and maybe God ideas and what um, really should be action really should be taken on? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, really, I the longer I stay in that and I'm not taking action, um, you know, because, you, you know, I want to get somebody else's opinion on it. You know, I, I will ask somebody about the si- certain situations that, you know, I'm trying to figure out in my own head. And really, I need to find somebody else to talk to, whether it's a therapist or, um, you know, um, a family member, but mostly it's, it's going to come down to somebody in the program and they're going to make more sense than anybody else. Really. When I talk to them. Yeah. I, I love the, the visual that I've heard people say, um, when, when I start, um, having my own little ideas and, and plans and, and everything, and I'm not bouncing it off of somebody else. I've had somebody say, you know what? You may as well walk up to the nearest intersection, knock on somebody's window that you didn't know, roll down the window and say, you know, what? I'm going to turn my will and my life over to you because you're going to do a better job with it than I'm going to do with my own ideas. And and I have <laughs> I've seen that in my own life many times where when I try and take control and try and mm-hmm. uh, lead the way with my own thinking, I get in a bunch of trouble. Do you have any specific maybe uh, experiences in your life where something like that has happened where you maybe started going down the wrong path and you went, you know what, I need to reach out to somebody and they steered you back to turn what turned out to be the right path. Yeah. I'll just uh, talk a little bit about something that's been on my mind here and um, I didn't share it in my Sure. Um, but it's, uh, my son, um, he's 17 years old and he wants to transition 
Now this, uh, he told me a few weeks ago and right away, <laughs> right away, uh, I, I didn't know how to react, you know, and the fact that I wasn't reacting kind of bothered me. Like, you know, I didn't have a reaction really. Um, and so I decided to, you know, pursue some help as far as like, you know, having reached out for, uh, to other parents and that are going through the same thing because it's something different that, that I never thought I'd have to deal with in sobriety or not sobriety. Um, but thank God, you know, thank God that I'm um, working a 12 step program and then I'm able to deal with something like this because, um, you know, he is my son and, um, his, his feelings matter. Um, I know I have to set aside that and, and really start understanding what, uh, what God wants me, um, how he wants me to react or how he wants me to handle this. So this is kind of new. Um, but you know, him and I are going to be going to my daughter's play tonight. And, you know, this is what recovery gives me you know, the opportunity to be there for my kids, no matter what, no matter what, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and I love how you ended that, uh, you know, it gives me the opportunity to be there for my kids, for anybody who I love, no matter what, and share the, well, acceptance of how things are uh, with love and, and open and openness, you know, what, uh, and anything else on that that you want to share? Yeah, no, I just, uh, you know, like with, with alcoholism, you know, I had to find a support group, you know, I had some people to identify um, that I could identify with. And so I did in this matter and it's helping me, you know, this isn't uh, people that are dealing with alcoholism. They're dealing with, you know, the uncertainty of how to react to something like this and how to accept it. And it, and the more I go to these rooms, the better um, uh, understanding that I am with this and the process that it all takes. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Tony. Any, uh, final words of wisdom before we start closing down this, uh, this meeting? Wisdom. Hmm. <laughs> well, um, just, you know, like I said before, um, if you're new to this deal, um, or you're coming back like I have so many times that, you know, there's a reason why we're here. You know, there is a reason for you to be here. And when um, you take some action into this program, it is going to be amazing. You know, those actions look like is getting a sponsor, um, calling that sponsor, um, and uh, being a service. Uh, in and out of these rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. And then, um, and having that conscious contact with God, whatever that looks like to you. You know, to me, I I still have a problem with being able to get connected with him. And I have that connection that seems like through others, you know, um, people like Justin, you know, and his platform and things like that, that, that I believe that that's God giving me other opportunities, you know, for my recovery, because I need those. And so if you are new or coming back, it, this is right here. It's laying down like right in front of you. You know, it all, it all that matters is how much action you take and how much you're willing to be. That's a word that I haven't used much today. I should have been using a lot of that willing, you know, the, the how of this program, the honesty, the open-minded, and the willing. Um, those are three things that that really um, can help you. And I, and, and I know your struggles. I've been there. But we can all do this. We don't have to do this together. Thank you. And thank you, Tony. Thank you for being willing to come in and share your story with us here on RICO 12. It's a great meeting and and. You know, if you out there in the listening audience have questions or want to connect with Tony, please send an email to rico12pod at gmail.com. That's R-E-C-O-1-2-P-O-D at gmail.com to join in this conversation or to connect with Tony. If you haven't done so already, please consider rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts. It is a powerful way to work step 12 in getting this message out to more people, making it more visible to people seeking solution. 
Next Friday, we'll be back and we will hear from Michael S., who has been a previously a previous speaker with us on meetings 68, 110, and 200. And he will be speaking on his chosen topic, Life After 10 Years in Recovery. And I look forward to his talk. Stay tuned on the WhatsApp community if you want to join that. Send an email also to that same email address, rico12pod at gmail.com, and we'll get you in that uh, WhatsApp community. Now, let's launch off into the rest of our day with the we version of the serenity prayer. Tony, are you willing to say that for us? Absolutely. Thank you. Moment of silence for the still suffering alcoholic in and out of these rooms. The we version of the serenity prayer. God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change. The courage to change the things we can and the wisdom to know the difference. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Remember, everybody, there is one who has all power. That one is God. May you find God now. Keep coming back. Continue to work this program. Let's trudge this road of happy destiny together. Work it. You are worth it. I've seen stars fall from above Falling in and out of love I've been high and I've been low Now I know I just can't do this on my own I've seen a boy become a man He got lost without a plan so far away from home Now I know I just can't do this on my own Your arms surrounding me Your touch is grounding me No longer searching for purpose on Cause now I know just can't do this on my own I'm looking for the words to say You make the world a better place I can call that place my home Cause now I know That I just can't do this on my own Your arms surrounding me Your touch is grounding me No longer searching for purpose on Stars fall from above I fell in and out of love I got high and I fell low But now I know That I just can't do this on my own No, I just can't do this on my own I just can't do this on my own